from the Newstead NBC Weather Center for tonight. We'll be looking at mostly cloudy skies, some rain showers light coming your way. Temperatures in the 40s on Saturday. Showers in the morning, especially up near Lake Ontario. Those will diminish in the afternoon. A blustery, chilly day in the 40s to near 50. Sunday, the nicer of the two weekend days with some sunshine, a bit milder in the mid and upper 50s. I'm Rich Canelia on WYSL. The following paid commercial program was furnished by the program sponsor. The WYSL stations present an hour of truth for the battered but proud people of the Empire State. From the financial and entertainment epicenter of New York City to the sleeping and empty small cities and towns of upstate, which once bustled with manufacturing, mining, and farming. We all know from inspiration, history, and nature, we deserve a return to the success and growth of generations past, a birthright being squandered by corruption in Albany, and the depredations of insecure, scheming mountebank posing as governor, who loathes both us and himself. As liberty beckoned to enslaved peoples behind the Iron Curtain by American broadcasts after World War II, we now say, believe, rise, and join us. Welcome to Radio Free New York. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us again here at Radio Free New York, where we talk about all of your rights all the time. I've got Bob Savage in studio as always. Ahoy, mateys. And we've got another guest who will be joining us here shortly. Um, I want to remind everybody, last show we got some call-ins. That was awesome. So if you're listening to the show and you want to call in, ask us a question, give us your two cents, give us a call, 585 346 3000 or 866 552 1009. We figured out at the last show the Verizon number is dead. It's kaput. It's gone. So nobody's used it for years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's like you gave it out. Like, Maybe we should check and just make sure that it works. And it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. So um, speaking of the last show, that is up on AYR.show. If you want to listen to the podcast there, um, it's also on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, whatever your flavor is, feel free to check it out. Um, but what we talked about is we talked about activism and how activism looks different to different people. Um, my level of political activism is different than my wife's, than my family's, than my friends. Um, and there's a lot of just different ways you can do that, whether it's sharing with friends and family, voting with your money. That's that's a big thing. Choosing to support businesses that support your values and your principles. Um, we also talked about the New York State throughway tolls and uh, a way to eliminate those if if uh, if that's something you're interested in. And uh, we talked about how Cuomo vetoed eliminating the tolls in Syracuse. So I'm sure the people in Syracuse uh, were really happy when that happened. Um, and one other thing that I want to remind everybody, I'll try to remind a few times to the show, today is the last day to register to vote. Yeah, actually, as, uh, yeah, as you're listening to the show, if you're listening to a replay later on the weekend, you missed the bus. Yep. So uh, Friday, October 12th, this is it, guys. You got to get out there, register and vote and get a friend to do the same thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, Friday, October 12th, today, I believe if it's postmarked by today, you're okay. But really, go down to your local board of elections, fill it out. Mike, Oklahoma. And uh, make sure that they have it so that you uh, you have a chance to have your voice heard this November. And it uh, looks like we've got a call in. So. Yeah, a call in from Oklahoma. Whereabouts in Oklahoma there, uh, uh, Mike? Uh, Norman. Norman. Norman, oh, okay. He, yeah, you know where the... Oklahoma University is. If you say so, I'm not familiar with the state <laughs> yeah, at all. Yeah, the, it, no, it's cool. And uh, you're talking about activism. Yep. I think activism fucking sucks. And these. Okay, uh, that's fine. Let's keep our uh, uh, comments in good taste, if we possibly could. And uh, so you were talking about activism when we started yes. the show. Yes, yes, yeah. So we're just talking about activism, how that looks different for every single person. Um, and that might be knocking on doors. That might be choosing who you shop with. Um, and that might be running for office. Each, each person has different activism. Um, oh, and just so people know, I kind of mentioned this, but we are live not just on WYSL, but WYSL's got three stations running right now. 
We've got uh, 1040 AM. We've got 921, and the new one is 955 out in Spencerport. Yep, yep. So welcome on, to on the west side. Yep, welcome to all those guys. Uh, we're also live on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Feel free to call us in. Um, on the air, we have to be careful about what's said, though. There's FCC rules. Um, so with that being said, many times when Larry and I travel the state, people ask us this question. They say, hey, you know, you and Larry, you're just one person or you're just two people. How are you going to get this specific policy um, put into play? How are you going to get through the assembly? How are you going to get through the Senate? And depending on the type of legislation, there's different ways. But one of the ways that I love talking about that people kind of forget about is there's elections every year. It's not just every four years, governor and lieutenant governor, or comptroller and AG. Um, no, every year in New York, politicians are up for a vote. They're up, their seats are up, they're available. And to to make this stuff happen, yeah, we're going to have to bring some serious change in New York. We're going to have to get people um, elected into office that support your values and your principles. And so today on the show, I've actually got a person who's running for assembly in the 139th dis district. Mark, uh, introduce yourself. Huh. Hello, everyone. My name is Mark Golokowski. And Matt. And um, so Mark is running in the 139th district. What, what areas does that cover? It covers all of Genesee County, all of Orleans County, with the exception of the town of Shelby, and the four western towns of Monroe County, which are Hamlin, Clarkson, Sweden, and Riga. Awesome. And I think the radio station covers that whole area. Yeah, pretty right? much. Yeah, uh, yeah it's, uh, it's, it's pretty good except for the extreme western part uh, uh -huh. when you get it out into Orleans County. But the, uh, the Monroe County towns, yeah. Yeah, awesome. Very good. And it sounds like we've got another caller on the line. No, he's gone. He, oh, he went, he oh we away. lost him. Yeah. Okay. All right. Very good. Um, so, Mark, it, for the constituents in your area that might be listening, what uh, what would you say to them maybe top two or three things that's important for them and important for you? Well, what's important for me is that I would like to, people to begin recognizing the tyranny that we live under. Um, you can't miss it if once you start recognizing it. Um, we have zoning codes. We've lost a lot, a lot of our Ninth Amendment rights and our Tenth Amendment powers. You no longer have the right to own property. Basically, you rent it from government. Uh, we've lost the ability to basically raise our own children. Once they go to school, they're out of your control. You don't even know what's happening because like, for example, in the town of Alabama, the, um, the school system has this confidentiality uh, principle. And if an incident happens, they won't even tell the parents what happened, who was involved, what the investigation found in terms of, of what discipline they should be taking or what the discipline is. Absolutely nothing goes to the parent. Um, we've lost our ability to control our own kids once they, they disappear from our site. Um, what happened in Rochester is a perfectly great example of what the powers in our, our governments can do in terms of keeping parents away from their kids. Um, that just concerns me dramatically. It also concerns me the fact that we have to report to the government every penny we earn because they don't consider it our income. They get to tell us how much of their income we earn and we get to keep um, how we spend it. And if we don't spend it and keep it properly, they will take more of it from us. This is all tyranny. And there's all kinds of examples that we cover on the show issue and I can show you how tyranny is involved. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I, I don't think we mentioned, I know the answer, but the listeners might not. Um, what what party affiliation are you running under? Uh, <laughs> you know. uh, it should be pretty obvious that I'm running under the libertarian uh, banner. Yeah. Uh, I am a libertarian. I believe you have a right to live your life any way you choose. You have a right to live on your property any way you choose. The government should not be telling you what you can and can't do with your own property. You should not have to go down to the government and get permission to change a window or to improve your property. It's your property. That's basically extortion. And if you don't pay the extortion bill, uh, which is a zoning code bill or building permit, uh, they will kick you off your own property. Yeah. So this is just another form of tyranny. 
Now, yeah. uh, Mark, you've uh, you had a long history with the Libertarian Party. Uh, well, not that long. I used to be a Republican, and um, about 2009, I began realizing what was wrong with our society and that the Republicans are actually part of the problem. Um, they and the Democrats actually put in the 16th Amendment, which the U.S. Supreme Court has declared five times is unconstitutional. It's an unconstitutional law of the land. But the U.S. Supreme Court can't change the law of the land. Only Congress, at the insistence of the people, can change the law of the land. And whenever the U.S. Supreme Court has said that, everybody yawned and went back to watch a baseball game. So libertarians are stepping forward and saying, look, we got to do something to get back to our original principles and establish freedom in the country. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, what's interesting is when Larry and I talk about these issues and we travel across the state, we hear this all over. And and just to pull one of many things that you talked about, simple things like zoning. Zoning in many ways takes away your rights to your own property and makes you pay somebody else for something that, that maybe you shouldn't. You know, it's interesting. My first experience with zoning was in the city of Rochester, where I found out that after hiring a licensed electrician, see, I thought I was doing everything right. I, I went, I, you know, I didn't have some guy do it on the side. I got a licensed insured electrician to replace an outlet in my house. And I was told that, oh, you need a permit for that. I'm like, what? Well, what do you mean? You're a licensed electrician. Like, what? What more? Well, the the city of Rochester wants wants you to pay them seventy five bucks to uh, to approve this change in your house. I'm like, so seventy five dollars to the city to prevent me from burning down my house. And I was like, well, what's your fee? Eighty bucks. <laughs> I'm like, so I'm paying eighty dollars to the electrician, seventy five dollars for the to the city for permission to repair my own home. And that's, yeah, that type of stuff has got to go. It's got to go. Yeah, it, it, it absolutely has to. Um, I, I, well, you mentioned um, your campaign and Larry's campaign. I'd like to point out a little bit of difference in terms of the difference in our objectives. Mm -hmm. uh, your campaign and Larry's is a very practical approach to how to take the steps necessary one at a time to get to where we have to go. My campaign is about where we want to go. I want to keep pointing to the end goal, and the end goal is freedom. And the only way we're going to get there is if people understand what the problem is. And once they understand what the problem is and where the goal is, then they'll understand why you want to take the steps you're going to take. Yeah. And uh, I think two of them, the two of us working together um, – a voice in the assembly and, and then somebody at the, uh, the state level actually doing the implementation, it's going to be a, a powerful um, force to cause change in, the, in New York State. Yeah, absolutely. I agree 100%. All right, you're listening to Radio Free in New York on the WISL stations, and we thank you very much for joining us. Andrew and Mark will return in just a moment. I want to turn this state around. I want to revamp our education system from K through 12 to K through 10 with no federal money and no new taxes. I want to repair our broken family court system so that when you lie in court, it is a crime. I want to support new industries like blockchain and open source and hemp and cannabis to support our struggling farmers. You might say these ideas are radical. No, they're bold. We need new, bold ideas to save this state. And this new message is approved by Larry Sharp. Hey everyone, it's me, Shannon Joy. Join me Tuesday, October 16th at 6 p.m. for Libations for Liberty at the Dutch Mill Restaurant on Dewey Ave. Libertarian candidate for governor Larry Sharp and his running mate Andrew Hollister will be joining me, so don't miss this fun event. Go to the Shannon Joy Show Facebook events for more information. You should definitely come to this. It'll be fun. Libations for Liberty, Tuesday, October 16th at 6 p.m. at the Dutch Mill Restaurant. You're listening to Radio Free New York on the WYSL station. All right. So here we are. We're back. Um, you know, I asked this question last week. I'm, I'm going to ask it again because a lot of people said that it resonated with them. And the question is, it's actually a, a list of questions. Um, if you were to measure where we are today to where we were 10 or 20 years ago, how do we compare? If you measure our politicians today from 10 or 20 years ago, are they more corrupt? I'd say yes. I'd say yes, with worse corruption. 
In fact, uh, I was just talking uh, with somebody today, and they said somebody – oh, I forget. The, the guy who just – got brought up or admitted to corruption charges uh, here locally. To Arrigo. Yes, yeah. 133rd. Yep, 133rd, admitted to accepting a bribe from, I believe it was a developer. Is, yeah, is that- I don't know. If, have they identified who the developer is and what the development – and then there's some other – somebody else, a lobbyist who was involved? I don't know if there's an update on that or, or not. Yeah, I, I don't know the specifics, but it, it seems like every other week now we're we're seeing – Elected officials in New York State being brought up on corruption charges. And the reason for that is, and the reason it keeps recurring, is that there's never any really meaningful consequences. So we have Dean Skelos, uh, former leader of the Senate, and we have uh, Sheldon Silver, former leader of the Assembly, both convicted of like really broad ranging, uh, uh, you know, corruption on a massive scale. And really kind of stomach turning too, in terms of the arrogance with which it was it was uh, imposed upon people who had to pull out the money and and, and pay Dean Skelos' dopey loser son mm. and so on and so forth. And there, is are they in jail? I don't think so. I don't think is, it har- is. is it, is it uh, house arrest or something? Mark, yeah. do you know? I have no idea. Okay. Well, I, in any case, I mean, these people have stolen millions and millions and millions of dollars. Yeah. And uh, and then we see, of course, throughout the, you know, the Cuomo administration is record-breaking mm-hmm. in, in terms of, uh, of corruption and convictions. Yeah. So uh, it, I, I think that it goes, it, it's on a huge scale and – our sources within the FBI have told us that with Joe Arrigo, that the the real crime that he he committed, other of course than the alleged he hasn't been convicted yet, mind you, mm. uh, but uh, is that he's so dumb because he was so he was so blatant about it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, and the FBI tells us this is it's rampant. It's everywhere. Yeah, yeah. New York but State. I, I think one of the problems that the citizens have is that. They do not get the information in terms of what's happening. The news media just blanks, blanks it out, mm-hmm. and it's just not there. And this is one of the reasons why we don't know what the situation is, is because it's not being covered. And I think it should be, because corruption is really a reflection of the of the principles, the moral character of the person that was elected. And if they, they've, if they believe what's practical is more important, their principles, and they're not willing to take the hard steps just because it's more practical to take the easy steps, then you're going to get what you got. And I believe you need, people would need to start voting for candidates that have principles and believe principles are basically their primary objective is to stick with them. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. And I, I, I certainly see that And I hope that a lot of people see this too, that our system itself is so broken that it allows for this corruption to happen. I mean, yeah, we've got people in there who are bad people, but they're taking advantage of a system that's open to it. Well, part Um, of the problem is that we we now report from the top down ever since the 16th Amendment, income tax. The money flows down. The authority flows down. It used to be the money was collected locally, towns and villages given to the county. Towns and villages had some control over the county. Counties gave it to the state. The counties had control over the state. The states had control of the federal government. Once the 16th Amendment went in, the first thing that happened was the senators got elected by the people the states, the states lost all control of federal government. That there was a republic. We don't have a republic anymore. Yeah, no, it, nobody you know, represents the, the states. The great progressive era of uh, Woodrow Wilson. We have the income tax, then we have the popular election of senators. And as Mark is explaining, the senators used to be the states' representatives in the federal government, and senators were appointed by the states, and they can be recalled at any time no. if uh, if uh, the people of the state felt that. Uh, uh, the, the the Senate was not representing their interests. They would talk to their stall, state lawmakers, and that senator, that U.S. senator, came back. Yeah, yeah, and, it, and it's funny you you mentioned the counties used to have control. Today in New York State, that's all in Albany now with our unfunded mandates, and that's actually a position Larry and I talk about all the time about let's let counties be counties. Give you your localized control. Keep your tax dollars back. In your county, Albany shouldn't be scooping up and collecting everybody's tax, do- tax dollars and then dangling it above, you know, oh, Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, you know, who's going to get this time, you yeah, know, carrot and no. stick. Yeah, no, it should just stay in your county. Andrew Cuomo's uh, 
Hunger Games. Yes, yes, the Hunger okay. Games. Yep. And, and I, the reason why I focused on the the structure and wanted to make some mention about the fact that the counties used to control the state is because that's the goal is to give the counties that structure again mm -hmm. and to have the local people basically control the counties. We still have that structure in the electoral system where the, uh, we have board of elections at the county level. But when it comes to making laws, laws come from the top down mm -hmm. and they should go from the bottom up. And uh, you have a strategy to get there. I want to just keep focusing on the goals and make people understand why we're doing what we're doing. Absolutely. And we've got some comments on Facebook, guys. Always feel free to comment on the feed here. Uh, Tony D says hello to Mark G. Hello, Tony. Yep. And we've got Joel saying awesome tax talk, fair tax, and the 16th Amendment and the IRS. And uh, we got a whole bunch of thumbs up in here as well, a couple hearts. So people are uh, certainly interested in, um, in what we're talking about. So the 139th uh, Libertarian candidate uh, there in uh, Western Monroe and uh, Orleans and Genesee County. What, uh, what, what do you perceive the real concerns of the folks are out there in, in your district? Well, I have two that I've, I've perceived. One is the amount of grant money being given to companies and basically wasted. We have with a 77 stamp project. Uh, theoretically, it's an industrial park in the middle of farm country, 45 minutes away from both Buffalo and Rochester. People, professionals aren't going to travel there, but the expectation is they will, especially in the winter time when the snow's blowing. Uh, whiteouts apparently don't matter to people. A lot of snow in Genesee uh, County. Yeah, and uh, $28 million disappeared. What they what you can see there is a roadway going from Route 63 to a town road. There's nothing in the middle except uh, empty fields in this roadway with two little spurs that go about 50 feet. Um, and if you look around the countryside, more cows than there are people. Um, when you take and you, you then realize that the $28 million built a sewer line from that state to Orleans County, Orleans County residents are going to have to pick up the the bill for the sewer treatment of industrial waste, Orleans County doesn't have any industry. So I mean, that itself is, is kind of um, no, a good, good example of, uh, of the waste storage resources. Uh, and what, uh, what can you do about that? Well, I believe that grants should never be given to companies. If, if the project is actually economically viable, Companies will invest in it automatically. If it's not economically viable, they will take money from the federal government or the state government. And as long as the money is coming to them, they'll keep doing it. But as soon as the money has gone from the government, because it's not economically viable. We have a great example with a 260-foot-tall wind towers. Uh, th these are astronomical towers that are proposing to put up in these counties. And not just one or two. They're talking about a whole sewer things, you be able to see them for miles. Um, if it was economically viable, they would be talking about reducing your your electric rates, um, uh, so all kinds of benefits. But right now, they're talking about, well, we want to do this because in the future, your electric rates are three times higher than they are now. Um, that would never even be considered by industry unless governments are willing to reach into your pockets and take money from you to give to this company. But just to make to be more expensive than the current cost of electricity. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't make any economic sense at all. And even with the subsidies, it's marginally successful. Right. If you want to wind, wind power, go to 104. And you'll see uh, two wind towers together. The, the, the plastics company put up one wind tower to gener generate electricity for its own use. It was economically viable. So economically viable. They were able to put another wind tower right next to it. They didn't have to worry about the amount of wind shear and stuff causing the towers to become inefficient. And they're generating surplus electrical energy. Those wind towers are economically viable and six feet tall. So built by private enterprise. Because they looked at it and it made economic sense. Yeah. So, yeah, I would think that's one of them. The other is I've seen my opponent 
doing a groundbreaking for a multi-million dollar complex and they had $10 million given to the town of the city of Batavia uh, to basically put up they're going to focus on basically five different companies to build these high rise uh, executive buildings and stuff, maybe a hotel. And then approximately a 7% of the $10 million would be left for everybody else to use. And I was traveling around. I was just astonished at how many abandoned properties, really nice looking properties are now abandoned or they have tags on them saying that there was a violation not to be occupied because it was a violation of a zoning code. And, you know, this is where we need to start having government focus on what's going wrong in our society. Why are people walking away from perfectly good uh, residences? Why is it that adults, when, when they become senior citizens, stop investing in their own property? It's because they have a fixed income, and if they spend the money keeping their property up to date and current, what's going to happen is the tax is going to, going to go up. They'll lose the property. They don't want to lose the property because then they'll be homeless. And so they don't put it in, and their homes basically you know, get run down. We need to focus on that end of the economic spectrum, not these multi-million dollar projects that nobody really wants to invest in on their own. The voice of Mark Wogowski, a candidate for the Assembly, and Andrew, what do we got coming up next? So what we got coming up next, we're going to talk about our bad law. And uh, I gave Mark choice on this. Those of you who know Mark probably already know which one it is. Um, but if this is your first time hearing him, you get to find out after this break. WYSL 92.1 FM, 95.5 FM West, and uh, News Power 1040 AM. We'll be back. You're listening to the voice of liberty. AM 1040 Avon Rochester, FM 92.1 Rochester, FM 95.5 Spencerport, and WYSL1040.com everywhere. Hi, my name is Yolana. My husband, Andrew Hollister, is running for lieutenant governor along with Larry Sharp this year, and I'm really excited about it. Uh, and I wanted to share a story with you. So I'm in the Susan B. Anthony Square. Um, I thought it was very fitting because if it wasn't for her, I would not have the right to vote this year. Um, so I'm an immigrant. I immigrated here from Czech Republic, and I get to vote this year, which is really exciting. So. Last year I applied for my citizenship. It was the same year that Andrew ran for city council and I was really hoping I would get to vote for him as my first time casting a vote because how cool would that be? Uh, but I did not get my citizenship in time. I did, however, meet Larry Sharp at the same time and I loved him off the bat. I was never really someone who was interested in politics, uh, but meeting somebody who was so down to earth and really had good principles and wanted to take New York in a great direction meant a lot to me. So when I became a citizen this year and I found out he was running for governor, I was really excited that that was going to be the first vote I get to cast. To make things even better, Andrew actually ended up running with him as lieutenant governor after I got my citizenship. So now I got to vote for two of my favorite people. Um, but the other reason it's so exciting, other than getting to vote for them, is that I get to cast a historical vote this year. When these two win, it's going to be historic for the whole United States, and I get to be a part of that. My first vote gets to be part of something big and historic, and I get to vote for my husband. So I'm urging you, if you've never voted, whether you weren't a citizen or and are now, or you just never had the motivation to go out and vote, I would love it if you could come join me to cast this historical vote in this election and help make a new New York. You're listening to Radio Free New York on the WYSL stations. Well, you can tell by our theme music, it's time for another bad law. Here's Andrew Hollister, a libertarian uh, candidate for lieutenant governor. Yep, yep. So we've, we've got our bad law queued up here. I just want to remind you guys, uh, if you want to call into the show, 585 346 3000 or 866 552 1009. And the bad law is going to be income tax. And I know that that's Mark's absolute favorite because ever since I've met Mark and known Mark, it always comes up. Look at Mark. He can't help. He, he can't help. He, he just can't wait. Yeah, he just can't wait. Yeah, he's, he's, <laughs> he's getting giddy. He's bottled up. He's ready to go. So I'm going to let you just take it. Okay. Um, yes, income tax is one of my favorite subjects to talk about primarily because it is tyranny. Even Grover Cleveland called income tax at 3% at any percent. 
it is an act of tyranny. Um, the U.S. Supreme Court of, in 1896 declared income tax totally unconstitutional. And that was because in 1894, rather, 1894, the U.S. Supreme, the, the uh, U.S. Congress had passed an income tax law. So in 1896, when they reviewed it, the U.S. Supreme Court pointed out that there were two uh, barriers in the, US, in the U.S. Constitution that prevented a direct tax on income. We did have an income tax uh, implemented in 1860 to help pay for the uh, the war debt for the Civil War, but it was only a 20-year bill, and by 1881, that, that money was gone. But they actually used that money to create the railroads that we currently have today. Uh, that was the source of most of the revenue to create the railroads. Um, the Democrats and Republicans got used to their money coming in, and they would change administrations uh, two or three times, and then by... 18, or 1909, they passed a bill that simply said the Congress can pass an income tax. Um, and I, I want to jump in here real quick because I think a lot of people don't realize that we didn't always have income tax. No, we did not. And, and they sometimes they'll ask like, oh, well, what would we do if we didn't have an income tax? How would we ever survive? They don't realize, yeah, we we didn't have one initially. We, no, no, we, we didn't. We, the government survived on tariffs and on sales taxes. Um, pretty much that was it. Uh, and, and also the government was very small, and it was the, the federal government in particular. The, the normal American citizen almost had no interaction with the federal government at all until the 1930s. But that's correct. Uh, that matter of fact, uh, Woodrow Wilson's New Deal was one of those times when the U.S. Supreme Court said— You mean FDR's? FDR's, rather. I'm sorry. <laughs> FDR's New Deals was— um, was declared unconstitutional, um, but it was consistent with the law of the land. Congress had the authority to uh, r issue a tax because of well, the 16th Amendment, and they can do anything they want with that money because it's their money. Right. It, it came about because of a constitutional amendment, because otherwise it would have been perpetually turned down. Yeah. But, but one of the reasons it was declared unconstitutional is because it totally changed the interaction between the government and the people. Right. Grant Johnson's Great Society was another time when they said the entire bill is unconstitutional but consistent with the law of the land. U.S. Supreme Court can't change the law of the land. Only Congress at the insistence of the people can change the law of the land. You keep hearing this over and over, and no wonder people went back to the um, watching the baseball game because nobody did anything. And then we have the NDA Act, using the same justification, the government can do anything with its money that it wants, it can use the money to implement the NDA Act. Well, the NDA Act, the, that bill basically took away your fourth uh, amendment rights. So your due process is out the window. You can be taken away by the uh, Homeland Security. They don't have to tell anybody where they're taking you. They don't have to charge you. They don't... It, it's nothing. It's you can just disappear, and uh, there's nothing you can do about it currently. I believe it's time to get somebody into power that will actually address this issue. Is that what we know as the Patriot Act? The this part. The NDAA. The NDAA is, it? is part. Was well, part of the Patriot Act. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, it came after that, though. The Patriot Act was almost immediately. Oh, National after. Defense Authorization Act. Right. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And on, uh, we we've got some comments here. Jim is saying hello. And uh, some people commenting on YouTube as well who are excited. Uh, the Liberal Hammer, um, I will be on their show tonight at 9.30 Eastern. What is so, the Liberal Hammer? What's the, the Liberal Hammer, um, I believe they're a radio show and a podcast combined. Um, and I forget the name of the radio station that's going to be on. I'll, I'll make sure it's posted on social media. It should be on the events page there. Uh, but that's going to be a fun conversation tonight, 930. I believe there's two hosts to that show. Mm -hmm. And we're just going to talk about whatever uh, whatever is best and interesting to them. Well, I, I think going back to the income tax, I really don't want to leave this yet. Sure. At, yeah, the, state yeah, no, level, at the state level, yeah. we have an income tax. Many states have done away with it, and several of them are considering doing away with it. I believe New York State should be one of the states that joins that group that is getting rid of the income tax. Um, it, based on the income tax, they were able to implement the uh, real estate tax. And I believe the real estate tax has to go. 
Um, but in order to make it disappear, the local towns have to have a mechanism to basically fund themselves. Uh, they wouldn't be able to fund themselves at the current level under the current zoning code laws and the way they're structured because they discourage businesses. But I believe the only uh, legal source of revenue for the town should be a local town tax. I would like to see the state pass a bill that authorizes towns to have a sales tax and encourage businesses in their town so that people can make a living and don't have to travel 45 minutes in, in blinding snowstorms to earn a living. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So so is it safe to say then that if you were elected to the state assembly, um, you would remove or vote to remove the state income tax. Absolutely. Yeah. No, no question about that. Awesome. I assumed as much, but I, I figured <laughs> I would even you know, sponsor I, the bill. I would even propose the bill if I could find a sponsoring. Everything. Awesome. Very good. Um, and, and you mentioned you in property tax as well. Is that property tax property as, well. Tax as well. Okay. Right. And awesome. I know that the, the governor is actually looking at ways to get rid of property taxes, and he's, but he's doing it with basically refunds. So the government's still taking the money. Wait, well, and, I missed this. Cuomo's looking to get rid of the property taxes? Uh, yeah, he's doing it with with refunds. There was a whole purpose of the tax Yeah, like tax 300 cap. bucks a year or something. The, the tax cap was placed on the the system basically backwards. That was just a trick. That yeah. was just, just so he could say that he was reducing taxes. Right. Yeah, the, the, the cap is often broken by message of emergency or crisis or Absolutely. something like that. And and really when we come back to things like property tax, specifically in the counties and towns, really what's pushing that so hard is the unfunded mandates that come from Albany. Because what happens in your county, and this is just for the listeners who, who may not be familiar with this process, Albany creates unfunded mandates and forces them on your county, your town, your village. So when you start your budgeting process every year, you already start with a bunch of expenses that you have zero say in. Um, the only say you have is to lobby Albany. And right now, a lot of those votes are New York City votes. So they vote for what's good for them. Upstate kind of gets left behind just about every time. And you start a budget, say you have a million dollar budget for your town. You know, in many cases, uh, Monroe County, for example, and our unfunded mandates take up more than 85% of our budget. So we're really stuck with about 14 and a half percent. And if we eliminate those unfunded mandates, man, that frees up so much for you to get rid of those those property taxes. No, absolutely. But one of the things I'm concerned about is the way they're trying to do it right now. They're playing a shell game, especially with the uh, insurance payments you pay for medical insurance. They charge the hospitals and service providers for med medical services an enormous tax up front. And the state is actually using those payments to get federal matching grants. And then they give the money back to the uh, hospitals and the service providers with increased refund rates. I know there's a bill pending to have the tax, the federal money come back to the property owners as a basically tax rebate. But it doesn't eliminate anything, and all they have to do is then just change the percentages, and they still now have a new tax. Um, I think it's it's time to have the state stop playing that, that type of shell game. It's dishonest. dishonest to the government. It's dishonest to the hospitals. It's dishonest to the insurance companies, and it's especially dishonest to people that pay their insurance bills. Yeah, well, and, and that's something that comes up often is elected officials in New York will say that you're getting a tax cut. And really what they mean is they've shifted your taxes somewhere else. So they maybe they give you a tax cut, as they call it. Um, and for those listening on the radio, yes, I'm giving air quotes over here. I know you guys can't see me. Um, it, so say they reduce the gas tax a little bit, but then they increase your property tax. They didn't actually cut tax. Well, they didn't actually cut spending. And that's really what needs to happen. We need Absolutely. to cut spending and the taxes will take care of themselves. What's happening is where spending is actually going up. They're saying they're cutting taxes, but really they're just shifting air. Like you said, a shell game. They're just shifting it around, moving it around, trying to make it sound like it's better. And we're like the highest tax in the nation. 
So with all, but with all these tax cuts, uh, how's that work? <laughs> you know, <laughs> we have all these tax cuts. We're still the highest tax in the nation. How's that work? So that's exactly right. They just move them all around. Yeah. So, well, part of the, um, the the problem that we have with the structure is that in order to get a tax cut, people don't want the services to disappear, but they don't want to. Um, step forward and actually do what's needed. For instance, let's take a, the issue of the homeless because it's very simple and straightforward. Right now, the all the government agents that deal with the homeless shut their doors and lock them at 10 o'clock at night. So if you're homeless after 10 o'clock at night, you didn't make it back, the door's locked. You're on the streets. It doesn't matter what the temperature is outside. Um, there's private enterprise. Uh, you, you get the, the people like the um, the... The Mercy House. Um, open door mission. In the open door mission. They're open all the time. And it, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If you're homeless and you get it to, to their get to their door, they'll they'll find a spot for you, even if it's just somewhere in the, the corner where it's warm. Um, private enterprise and private uh, uh, charities are actually much more efficient than the government could ever be. And the money doesn't come out of your pocket unless you're willing to donate. Yep. Um, so I, I, that's the way I would like to go with pretty much everything. They, some people say, well, how are you going to pay for the roads? Well, we pay sales tax now with gasoline. That's more than enough money to pay for the upkeep of the roads and the bridges. The problem is it goes into the general fund. And once it's in the general fund, there's no accounting for where it is or what it's used for, and they, they, they pilfer it away on all these other projects, uh, giving thousands and millions of dollars to companies for projects that are useless. So yeah, we have a lot of restructuring to do. Um, it's doable. Yeah, yeah ab absolutely. And if you want to hear about a plan to help with that, I think it was about two episodes ago, we talked about how we can maintain the roads without spending more tax dollars. Yeah. They have a plan. They're the Libertarians, and this is Radio Free New York on the WISL stations. We'll be back in a moment. I want to turn this state around. I want to revamp our education system from K through 12 to K through 10 with no federal money and no new taxes. I want to repair our broken family court system so that when you lie in court, it is a crime. I want to support new industries like blockchain and open source and hemp and cannabis to support our struggling farmers. You might say these ideas are radical. No, they're bold. We need new, bold ideas to save this state. And this new message is approved by Larry Sharp. Hey everyone, it's me, Shannon Joy. Join me Tuesday, October 16th at 6 p.m. for Libations for Liberty at the Dutch Mill Restaurant on Dewey Ave. Libertarian candidate for governor Larry Sharp and his running mate Andrew Hollister will be joining me, so don't miss this fun event. Go to the Shannon Joy Show Facebook events for more information. You should definitely come to this. It'll be fun. Libations for Liberty, Tuesday, October 16th at 6 p.m. at the Dutch Mill Restaurant. You're listening to Radio Free New York on the WYSL stations. Uh, Andrew, I just can't resist every show. We're not going to make America great again. It was never that great. We have not reached greatness. We will reach greatness when every American is fully engaged. We will reach greatness. When I have no idea what that means. I don't, nobody's ever explained it. But I think, uh, I suspect it means uh, when everybody agrees with Andrew Cuomo. I think that's what he thinks. I think that's what he means. I'd like to see every American in New York engaged to voting him out of office. That's, that's, uh, now that's you're what talking. I would love yeah. to see. Governor Headcase. Yep, yep. Um, somebody did comment on YouTube. They said, um, for some of these homeless people, they actually can't get their jobs, get back into the workforce because the shelters close at a time that's not conducive for them to get a job. So it's so it's an issue for those people as well. Um, just kind of a follow up on I mean, that last thing. Shelters are open 24 hours a day, aren't they? Uh, I open to our mission is well maybe maybe nonprofit ones. I'm not sure. I know I think Salvation Army closes at a certain time. 
uh, the one in the city because well, overnight shelters and there's others. That yeah, are not. there's there's different ones. I know um, there was an issue in Rochester with depending on when they release people on parole, they were supposed to check in with the shelter, but the shelters would be closed. The person would be out and about um, running around on the weekend. So there there is there must be some hours. I'm not sure if it's per organization, per entity. Um, but it's it's certainly something worth knowing about and discussing. It's, it's part of the c- the contract they get for getting government money is they have to close at certain times. That's a good point. Uh, a lot of these organizations are susceptible to being infiltrated by government. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's very tempting because they can get government funds that way, helps them pay the bills. The Mercy House is 100% privately donated money. Um, they put up this beautiful 86-bed uh, uh building for the homeless and within a month they were up at 120 people um but they're open 24 hours a day that's good yeah absolutely so here in our last segment i want to squeeze in the sharp update real quick the campaign update um i am running for lieutenant eric rochester and uh, Larry Sharp and I are traveling all over the state. This weekend is going to be another busy weekend. It's going to be in Albany area, Ithaca, Gasport. Um, Larry and I will be in Rochester at the Dutch Mill Tuesday night. Um, and I don't know if you guys saw the latest poll, but it looks really good. Tell us about okay, it. It came out. What, what uh, spe- tell yeah. us specifically. So, so this uh, so it's the Gravis marketing poll. Gravis does a ton of polling in New York State. Um and they're showing our momentum is growing, name recognition is growing. We're actually um, just about surpassed the Republican candidate in name recognition, which I didn't think that was very impressive at first, to be honest, when I read it. But then I realized Cuomo's running ads against this guy all day long, and we're passing him a name recognition. So that's that's amazing. For those who know who we are, we're taking second place. And it shows that if just one of the other candidates were to drop out, if we were able to get their supporters, we could win. All right, let's go to Eric on the line. Hey, Eric, how are you doing? Okay. Um, I just wanted to call in because you guys were talking about the various uh, shelters that are set up and, and how they run and uh, how the government kind of could do better. And how and you were saying that there seemed to be a problem with some of the way the shelters operate because – people who have jobs or want to can't utilize the shelter system and have a job at the same time because of the conflict of hours. I've been through the shelter system. Uh, the way that usually works is the shelter is occupied 24 seven basically, but they lock the front door to not let people in and out freely unless you have a, a phone number to reach. And then they will let you in on, a, on an emergency one by one basis. But if you're, like you have a job or something, there is an issue there because the, the problem is that you get out of work at, you know, 11 o'clock at night, um, they're, they can let you in, but it's a really complicated procedure and it's a pain in the butt to, to go through. Hmm. Interesting. Oh, just for clarity, we weren't saying the government could do the job better. <laughs> we, 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 we weren't suggesting that. Uh, but yeah, uh, we, I understand that. I'm just saying that, 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 and a lot of that is, as you kind of intimated, uh, a result of the way the government sometimes will help fund programs yeah. that they have to follow the regulations and protocols and procedures set out by the by the government in order to get that extra funding. There you go. All right. Yeah. I appreciate it, Eric. Thanks for the call. Yep. There always is strings attached. I'm from the, the government. I'm here to help. Money. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Who's shocked by this? Yep. Yep. So so knowing. Um, a little bit about the politics in in the area where you're running for office. Uh, I, I got a question for you. If okay. uh, if the Safe Act comes up for vote in the New York State Assembly, a repeal specifically, so a vote for the repeal of the Safe Act in the New York State Assembly, how would you vote? I would absolutely vote to repeal the Safe Act. The problem is most of the um, points in the Safe Act have already been implemented in other laws. So when they finally do get around to repealing the SAFE Act, it's just going to be lip service. But there's a bigger problem that I'd like the people to understand. You have a right to defend yourself, your family, and your neighbor if necessary. That's a Ninth Amendment right. You have a Tenth Amendment power to use deadly force if and when necessary. And basically what the state has done 
was to eliminate both of those. Um, the Second Amendment is not about your right to bear arms. In the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, the, it talks about powers of Congress, and Congress has the power to call up the militia. So the expectation is there will be a militia to call up. The Second Amendment is actually a restriction on the states for having a militia. And it says basically that the, a militia is necessary to maintain a free state. But because historically when, when governments had standing armies, they would disarm their citizens. And then when the citizens had a grievance and they created a ruckus to have their grievance addressed, the government would just slaughter their own citizens. We did not want that slaughtering happening in the U.S. And it's happened in the 20th century, if you just think of it, Germany. Um, so what we said was in the Constitution, the Second Amendment, you can have a militia because it's essential. We're expecting you to do that, but you cannot disarm your citizens. The reason is because it's one of the Tenth and Ninth Amendment rights and the Tenth Amendment powers that we reserved. If you read the Tenth Amendment very carefully, it says the, that all the power is not granted to the United States, nor restricted to the states respectively. Respectively points back to those powers and rights given to the states by the Constitution. So if it's not restricted to the states respectively, they're left to the people. What's really critical is that phrase not restricted to the states because that points back to the Second Amendment. The states are restricted in terms of having a National Guard, a state troopers, the city police, and a county sheriff. They're all part of our militia. And if the state is violating the Second Amendment and they've restricted you from having a weapon, you can't carry a concealed weapon, you can't even own a concealed weapon, then they're basically preventing you from defending yourself. And I believe that we need to actually look at New York State and start having the real consideration that the state loses its authority over those militia and have the federal government step in until we fix the law. Because right now, in order for me to carry a weapon, either I have to concede that the state has the right to infringe on, this, on my right to bear arms, um, which is basically giving them the right to violate the Second Amendment, so I would then get a permit and a, and a license, or I have to become a criminal. I'm not willing to do either. So as a result, the state has confiscated my right to defend myself and my family, and confiscated my Tenth Amendment powers to, to actually use force. Um, that's wrong, and we need to go back and redo this whole thing because the Sullivan Act, 1911, is a basically an infringement of people's right to bear arms, and they made it basically a violent felony if you carry a concealed weapon without their permission. Um, that's an infringement. I'd like to go back and have people be able to defend themselves. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So would you uh, vote to repeal the Sullivan Act? Absolutely, we vote to repeal the Sullivan Act. Um, you should have a right to carry a weapon. What we need to do, though, is raise the expectations of the average citizen. And what's happened recently in the last three, four months is they've actually raised, they've, they've lowered the expectations. And what they've done was raise the age of a, minimum, of a minor to 21. So the no, minor is not 18 anymore, a minor is 21. Parents are responsible for the actions of the minor. And they're now talking about potentially raising it to 26 because kids can stay home and be on their parents' insurance until they're 26. Mm. I mean, this is changing the expectations in the wrong direction. Well, I would like it, to lower it to the age of 14 and, and just say at the age of 14, since people are actually a lot wiser than we were because of the Internet. Um, Have you had a conversation with a 14-year-old lately? Um, only because the expectations are... Um, basically not there, but we're expecting them to act like kids. I've been in a conversation with a 12 year old and he reads the newspaper and he tells me what's in it and why people are doing things. Real, I mean, real they, quick, we only have a couple minutes left here. Uh, give us uh, some contact information and where people can uh, get in touch with your campaign if they want to support you. Okay, I, I use Facebook. I have a Facebook page, Glogowski for Assembly, as G-L-O-G-O-W-S-K-I. -G um, and you can message me on there. Um, 
I'd be more than willing to friend you. And uh, you can use my email. It's mglogowski08 at gmail.com. Okay. Uh, and uh, Andrew, I'm going to let you uh, wrap it up. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you guys so much for uh, joining in, tuning in. Uh, shout out to Debbie Cox. She said that she uh, really enjoyed the show and likes listening. Um, so if you need to find anything out about the Sharp campaign, Facebook.com, Andrew Hollister for a new New York, Larry Sharp for a new New York. Check us out. We'll be back next week. Hey, thank you so much for listening to Radio Free New York on the WYSL, WYSL stations. 1040 AM, 92.1 FM, and 95.5 West. We'll see you next time.